Hello, my name is Claudia Cominati. Welcome to this new year's webinar. I'm going to be today's moderator and Sebastian Ortiz de la Rosa will be doing the technical support. Today's talk is when the spike spike and who finds it, which learning objectives are, demonstrate knowledge on how to conduct EEC recording, including technical requirements, mounting electrodes, use filters, amplifier, electrode array, demonstrate knowledge of montage, advantage and disadvantage, interpret topographic voltage mapping, recognize and describe intricate abnormalities. It's an honor to me to introduce you, Dr. Sandor Benitsky, who is board certificate neurologist, clinical neuropsychologist, and epileptologist. He's professor at Arthur University Hospital, and he is the head of the clinical neuropsychology department at the Danish Epilepsy Center. He is the chair of the Joy EEC Task Force of the IFCN and ILAE, member of the ILAE Commission on Diagnostic Methods, ILAE Education Council, and the Executive Committee of ILAE Europe. He is editor in chief of epileptic disorder. The main research interest of Dr. Benitsky is EEC and epilepsy, focusing on electromagnetic search, imaging, seizure detection, standardization, and quality assurance in clinical neuropsychology. He has supervised eight PhD students. He's author of 147 peer review papers and 21 book chapters. Welcome, Dr. Sandler Brenitsky. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much, Claudia, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, joining you virtually. Uh, I tried to give a catchy title to my presentation, so when is a spike a spike and who finds it, but what I'm really going to talk about are the operational criteria for epileptiform EEG discharges, and who finds it alludes to the possible role of algorithms in reading EEG in the near future. But for those of you who are totally naive uh, for EEG, let me start by saying what an interictal epileptiform discharge or pattern is. So here, here you can see um, an example of them. And these are sharp transients in the EEG signal. They are typically, but neither exclusively nor invariably found in interictal EEG of people with epilepsy. And as you well know, if they are shorter, so 20 to 70 milliseconds, then we call them spikes. And if they come several times after each other, then they are polyspikes. And if they are longer, 70 milliseconds to 200, milli, uh, 200 milliseconds, then we call them sharp waves. So we call them spikes or sharps. Having said that, this is the outline of my presentation. So I will start by discussing why spike is at all interesting for a clinician. I will discuss the role of EEG and the interictal epileptiform discharges in the diagnostic workup of patients with epilepsy. Well, spikes are abused, and then we will see why EEG is overread and why that is dangerous. Then we will try to define the spikes. We will look at the new operational definition of the interictal epileptiform discharges as defined by the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology. Then I will show you validation studies and we'll look at many examples. I will talk about caveats like spike in normal variants and I will talk about the specificity of interictal epileptiform discharges. Then we'll look at the algorithms uh, and also uh, the hybrid systems and we'll, we'll see whether these will be kind of a game changer in the near future. So in 2014, the International League Against Epilepsy issued a new practical clinical definition for epilepsy. So um, you could fulfill this definition in several different ways. Of course, the easiest one was the clinically based one that you all know at least two unprovoked or reflex seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart. Why two seizures? Because many people have just one seizure, but no epilepsy, no disposition to generate again seizures. But if someone had two seizures, then the probability that the seizures will 
uh, occur again is more than 60%. So this is the classical one. But in 2014, the ILAE issued two more ways of how to define epilepsy. So one unprovoked or reflex epilepsy plus a probability more than 60% that seizures will reoccur. And here you can get a good use of your EEG. And the third one is the diagnostic of a diagnosis of epilepsy syndromes. And here you need EEG too. So let's look at the probability of further seizures after the first unprovoked seizure. Well, if you do an EEG in a person who had just one seizure, then if the EEG is normal in the child, the probability of reoccurrence is only 38% and in an adult is even lower is 12%. So with normal EEG, you would have statistically lower uh, uh, probability than the 60% threshold. Now, if you do an EEG in a patient who had his or her first seizure, and then if you record interictal epileptiform discharges, then in a child, the risk of seizure reoccurrence is 65%, and in an adult is 83%. So both are higher than the diagnostic threshold of 60% in the ILE definition. Now, I like a lot this plot that I borrowed for, from the Gudin Aminov textbook. Here on the horizontal axis, you can see the probability that the patient has epilepsy just based on your clinical information. But then you add an abnormal EEG. And then on the vertical axis, you can see how the probability is changed if you add to that clinical probability an abnormal EEG. Now, what does this plot tell, tell us? Well, if you have a low clinical probability, then even with an abnormal EEG, the probability, the risk will remain low. If you have a high clinical probability, you've seen the seizure, um, then the probability remains high. But here in the middle, is the portion where EEG changes a lot. So for example, if just based on the clinical information, uh, the patient has a probability of just 20% of having epilepsy. Now, if you add an abnormal EEG, then you already have a, pro a probability of seizure reoccurrence that is around 80%. So it's exactly in the middle of this X horizontal axis where you can get good use from your EEG. So what can we use so EEG for in, in patients with suspected epilepsy and seizures? Well, as I said, you can use it for diagnosis. Then you can get valuable information to further classify the epilepsy and localize if, if you have a focus. Then you can use EEG to follow up the progression in certain syndromes and the response to medication. And you can use EEG also to assess the risk of seizure reoccurrence in a patient who is otherwise seizure-free on medication, but you consider stopping the medication. So I said EEG and the spikes can be of use. Why did I say that? Well, because overreading EEG, issuing false positives, is the most common source of misdiagnosing epilepsy. So several studies showed that uh, those patients who are referred to tertiary referral centers um, because uh, they have uh, drug-resistant epilepsy, after the proper investigation, turn out that one third of them do not have epilepsy at all. Misdiagnosing epilepsy has detrimental consequences. Restrictions on driving, restrictions on career choices, then unnecessary exposure to side effects of the anti-seizure drugs, not speaking about not treating the real condition. Now, I would like to issue a warning, and it reads like this. The false positive EEG report that is overreading 
is potentially more harmful to the patient than the false negative reporting, that is the under-reading. Now, why is that? So if um, an EEG is normal in a patient with epilepsy, even if you under-read it, it's not such a huge problem because you know that you have to refer the patient again to an EEG, or even you have uh, sufficient information from, from your clinical data to, to diagnose epilepsy. But if not, then, then the, the patient will come to the second, maybe third EEG with sleep. So you can correct this. But if you overread an EEG, then regardless how many normal EEGs will be issued later on, this will be in the medical chart, and we know that spikes come and go. So when the physicians would read an old EEG report who said, yeah, yeah, now the, the EEG is normal, but five years ago, there were spikes. So you cannot get rid, basically, from, uh, of, a, of a false positive report. Now, what are the causes of overreading? Well, lack of proper training, first of all, and this is what we would like to address today. So at the end of this session, you should be experts in identifying spikes and sharp waves. Then another cause is this trying too hard syndrome. This is an expression that I borrowed from my friend, Bill Tatum. So um, I assume you know the Rorschach test, the systematic apperception test. So if, if you read a referral and then you think, hmm, based on the referral, the patient has epilepsy, which could be an er erroneous information in, in the referral. But yeah, then you, you try to find all sorts of spiky things, and then you try hard, and then you give a false positive. Then is the uh, fetishizing of the phase reversal in bipolar montage. So people who did not get a proper EG training think that everything that is spiky or sharp and has a phase reversal, that's abnormal. This is definitely not true. And then another cause is the too vague, imprecise definition or lack of widely accepted operational criteria. We did our best to improve that. So this is the, the old definition from the 1999 glossary of the IFCN. Uh, so this is defined as a transient, distinguishable from the background activity, this characteristic spiky morphology. Well, but what is distinguishable from the background? And, and then what is the characteristic morphology? Well, in authoritative places, it's always the word of the boss. So if the boss says that this is different than the background, then so it is. I never like the authoritative systems. So I always try to develop rules that apply everyone, the resident and the chief. So the most common normal patterns that were interpreted as uh, interictal epileptiform discharges are these fluctuations of the background activity or wicked spikes or wicked rhythms. So here you can see uh, examples from this very nice paper uh, by uh, Bill Tatum and Salim Bambadis. Well, here you can see it's, it's spiky. There is a phase reversal, spiky phase reversal, spiky phase reversal. So these were EGs misread as interictal epileptiform discharges. They are not. And I will try to explain you how to avoid this misinterpretation. So in 2017, the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology issued a new revised glossary. And in this glossary, we tried to, to put some operational uh, definition, some criteria for the spikes and sharp waves. So we still say that these are transients distinguishable from the background with the characteristic spiky morphology, but we added six criteria. And this infographic summarizes the six criteria. And now I will guide you through all these six criteria. So the, the first one is that the um, uh, discharge is D or triphasic with sharp or spiky morphology. So here you can see um, in this infographic, the spiky morphology. This is not enough. Important, necessary, but not enough. And here comes the second one. 
you measure the wavelength, the duration of the spike shock wave. Now, this must be different, either shorter or longer, as compared to the waves of the nearby background activity. So this is criterion two. Criterion three is about the asymmetry. I tried to, to draw this uh, in this infographic, so you, you can see it's asymmetric. So it's either that the sharp, uh, sharply rising ascending phase has a, a, a more um, steep uh, character than, than the, the descending phase or the other way around. The descending phase is more steep than the ascending one. So you need some asymmetry. The fourth criterion is a clear cut slow wave that follows the spike or the sharp wave. Now the fifth criterion is that the spike or sharp wave induces a change in the background activity. I, I tried to symbolize this. It, it's either a, a, an electrodecrement, uh, a flattening of the EG, uh, or you have a higher frequency, low amplitude activity. Usually this is after the spike, but sometimes you can see it also before the spikes. Now, the sixth criterion um, might be a little bit difficult to understand because many people read EEGs like 50 years ago. And although most of the EEG equipment nowadays have this possibility of displaying voltage maps, people don't use it. Now, the sixth criterion addresses exactly this amplitude map or voltage map, and it reads like this. A distribution of the negative and positive potentials on the scalp that suggest a source of the signal in the brain corresponding to a radial, oblique, or tangential orientation of the source, like an, uh, a dipole. This is best assessed uh, by inspecting voltage maps con constructed using common average reference. Now, here uh, I would like to, to go into more details and explain to you these voltage maps. So we, we need to go back to how the spikes and sharp waves are generated. Of course, they are generated in the gray matter. And then the postsynaptic potentials generate these return currents that give you the EG signal. Now let's zoom on this patch of cortex generating the spike and sharp wave. Well, of course, you know that this comes mainly from the fourth and fifth uh, layer of pyramidal cells that have a parallel orientation. And here you can see uh, a schematic drawing and both excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials can generate a spike or a sharp wave. Now, the distribution of the excitatory and inhibitory synapses is asymmetrical. So uh, in all these corticocortical synapses that contribute to generating a spike, the excitatory synapses are closer to the, the surface of the cortex. Here sodium goes in, uh, then the extracellular space will be more negative. And due to the return currents, you would have a positivity deeper in, in the cortical layer towards the white matter. Now, the inhibitory synapses are closer to the cell body. Here, chloride goes in, so the extracellular space will be positive, a return current, and again, the surface of the cortex will be more negative. This generates these dipole with a characteristic distribution of negativity and positivity. Negativity is towards the uh, su surface of the cortex uh, and positivity is towards the white matter deeper in. Now, um, many people, when, when they try to localize an EEG, they think of, of phase reversals and that's the only th thing they think of. Now, uh, I would like you to think of the EEG as a current. Now let's look at these two scenarios. Here, the source is a patch of cortex that is in parallel with the surface. Now then the neurons, the pyramidal cells, will have this perpendicular orientation to the surface, which will generate this type of return current. And then this is called a radial orientation. But fortunately, the brain is not flat. So we have sources also in the walls of the salt side. And here you can see such an example. 
but then the neuron will run in parallel with the surface and then the return current will be in this orientation which we call a tangential orientation now to make things simple i usually use an analogy from the military technology this is a rocket propelled grenade or bazooka now there is a tube and then there is an expo uh, explosion in this tube and then the expo explosion leads to exhaust gas leaving the tube in one direction and then a grenade leaving the tube in the other direction now this is exactly just like the neurons the pyramidal cells just that the negativity is the grenade and then the positivity is the uh, exhaust gas so when you try to localize a signal or or think of an eg signal then then try try to use this analogy and, and place this rocket propelled grenade somewhere in in the brain and then you will see what kind of negativity and positivity will come on the surface. And this is what I did here in this very simplistic, minimalistic drawing. So this is the head seen from above. And then I put there three scenarios. In the first scenario, we have a source that runs in parallel with the surface. So this is a radial orientation. Here on the top, you can, you can see, I, I zoomed in the neuron, so you can see the orientation. Now, as I said, negativity goes towards the surface. So you will have a relatively circumscribed area of large amplitude negativity. Why? Because your source has a radial orientation and is very close to where you record them. But the exhaust gas, the positivity, goes into the other direction and then feels pretty much the rest of, of the, the head. So you have a large area of small amplitude positivity surrounding the negativity. Why is, it, is the amplitude small? Because the distance is, is long from the source to the surface where you measure it. So this is the typical distribution of a radial source with a high amplitude circumscribed negativity embraced by low amplitude uh, diffuse positivity. Now, what happens if you place your source, your rocket propelled grenade, into the wall of a surface? Well, let's look at it. So this is the orientation of the neuron. And then again, grenade, this is the negativity anteriorly, and then exhaust gas in the other direction, so positivity. So this will generate a negative pole and a positive pole. So the distribution is very much different from, from the radial dipole. And here, your source will not be just under the peak negativity. It will be far away. It will be under the peak negativity only if the source has a radial orientation. But if you don't look at positivity, you will never know whether, whether the source is just under your phase reversal, just under the peak negativity, or far away from it as in the case of a tangential source. So in order to realize this, you need to monitor both the location of the negativity and the location of the positivity on the scar. Now, of course, if you put your source or rocket propelled grenade in the anterior wall of the central silicon, then you will see, again, a negative and a positive pole. But because the orientation of the neurons is in the other way around, then also, the negativity will, will be in the other place and the positivity and here. So, if you understand this, then you will understand also the voltage maps. Now, let's, let's come closer to, to a more realistic drawing after my minimalistic drawings. So, this is a, a radial orientation. You can see here, this is the patch of cortex generating your, uh, your signal. And then this will give the radial voltage map. It's a large amplitude circumscribed negativity embraced, surrounded by low amplitude positivity. Now look at, at how these, these lines, these isoelectric lines are regular. Now, this is a tangential orientation. Here, the source is in the wall of the sulcus. This is the way your RPG would fire again. This is the grenade, and this is the exhaust gas. So we can see there is a negative pole and a positive pole. Now, this 
uh, orientation uh, is the tangential and the previous one that's the radial. So this is what, what you need to remember. Now let's see some examples. So this is a radially oriented source in the uh, lateral superior part of the temporal lobe. And of course, this generates uh, a radial uh, orientation of the voltage map. Now, when, when you look at the voltage maps, you have color codes and the blue is for negativity and the red is for positivity. The deeper than ones of the blue is, the higher amplitude negativity you have and the deeper than ones of the red then more positivity is there. So again, circumscribed, um, uh, large amplitude negativity surrounded by positivity. This is a radial distribution. Now here you can see a, a source that is placed in the posterior wall of the central sulcus. This generates a negative pole anteriorly and a positive pole posteriorly, giving this tangential voltage map. Now again, let's let's look at these scenarios. So this is a tangential source uh, in the wall of a sulcus, negative pole, positive pole. This is a radial orientation on the convexity, and then this gives you a radial orientation. And then if if you have a combination of the two, this generates an O big time. So again, try to keep in mind how the voltage maps look like when the signal comes from the brain. This is very helpful uh, in assessing whether a sharp transient is, for example, an artifact, um, 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 something that does not come from the brain. But remember that not everything that comes from the brain is a spike or sharp wave. So uh, wicked spikes would have a very nice distribution that would correspond to the brain, yet they are not spikes. So this is, this is a use, useful element, this is a useful criterion, but again, this is not sufficient. Now, let me show, show you some examples of voltage maps. Can you see how irregular this is? When you look at these voltage maps, they, they do not make any sense. They don't come from the brain. They are neither radial nor tangential nor oblique. This is irregular, doesn't make sense as a signal from the brain. Uh, or in two dimensional voltage maps, again, very nice radial distribution here, um, but this is irregular, doesn't make any sense. Or, or this is again, like, like a noise, it doesn't make sense as a, a signal from the brain. So again, please remember, these are the voltage distributions that um, indicate the signal is coming from the brain and these kind of signals are not coming from the brain. Of course, you could ask, does this work? And then I, I named six criteria. How many do you need? Well, IFCN, just based on expert opinion, said, uh, okay, you, you need at least four. But is that correct? Well, we looked at uh, this with, uh, uh, I could corral my PhD student in a paper we have uh, uh, recently published. Uh, we looked at, at EGs that had a clear-cut gold standard. The gold standard was from the epilepsy monitoring unit from recording the episodes of the patients, either epileptic or non-epileptic episodes. Now, here we, we plotted the, uh, five, uh, the six uh, cri IFCN criteria uh, in this uh, receiver operating curve. Now, how shall we read this? On the vertical axis, you have the sensitivity. And on the horizontal axis, you have one minus the specificity. So if you want a high specificity, then you are closer to this uh, um, corner. And then because we don't want false positives, we want a sensitivity that is higher than 95%. So one minus 0 0.95, that is 0 0.05. So I only can accept what is to the left of this dotted line because this is the high specificity. Now in this part, I, I need to go for those criteria that ha have the highest sensitivity. And this is in our series for five criteria. Now, another um, trick that you can do because we don't live in the uh, uh, 20th century now, it's uh, uh, 2020 already. So you can do some computation, which is called a spatial filtration. 
And then you can transform the signals from the sensor space into the source space. And then here at the left, where we usually write the electrode names, now you can see some icons, which are actually regions in the brain. And then, for example, in this case, you can see a very nice epileptiform discharges, uh, mainly coming from the frontal pole. You can see here uh, in this icon that this is the frontal pole. And there is another one, and this is more widely distributed. Again, where does it come from? It's from the anterolateral part of the uh, uh, right frontal area and then temporal pole and even the inferior part of the temporal lobe. So uh, try to play with this and, and try to look at signals uh, in the source space instead of the sensor space. It's very easy. So here you can see the signals in the sensor space and this is the source space. It's quite, quite clear. Now, when we looked at this systematically, then uh, we realized that um, if you go for the source space, then you get a specificity that is higher than 95% our goal. And then if you go down to four criteria, your specificity will not reach the goal of 95%. But if you pick uh, at least five criteria, then you can reach the goal of 95% specificity with a sensitivity more than 80%. So uh, based on, on this study, we can say that uh, having at least five criteria fulfilled for a single discharge uh, gives you a specificity that is uh, higher than 95% and a reasonably good sensitivity. The same applies for reading the EEG in the source space. But is it just the number of the criteria that matters? And are all criteria created equal or is there a specific combination of these few criteria that accurately defines the interictal epileptiform discharges? Well, we looked at it uh, again with uh, uh, Aykut Kural, my PhD student. Uh, and then we, we used the data from the previous study that I just showed you. And then uh, we tried all kinds of combinations um, uh, of these criteria. This gives 63 different combinations. And then we plotted it again at this receiver operating curve. And then this is the highest sensitivity with the highest specificity. So we want to get closest plus possible to this corner. And then we, we took those that, that were closest. And these were uh, three combinations. It was uh, the spikiness, uh, the wavelengths, uh, the uh, slow wave, and the voltage map, one, two, four, six. And also there were two combinations of three criteria. This is the spiky, uh, and then wavelengths with the slow wave, and then the spiky with the slow wave and the voltage map. So based on the previous results, these gave the, the very best um, uh, sensitivity and specificity. But of course, um, there is the danger of overfitting the, the, the signal. So we tested this on a completely new and independent data set. So the completely new and independent data set showed that um, if you just rely on subjective expert scoring, then your specificity is low, is just 85%. But if you use this combination of, of criteria, then you will have a specificity more than 95%. So you're good specificity-wise, you're good with all these three criteria, but the best sensitivity at one, four, and six. So if you just have a, a spiky transient distinguished from the background, followed by a nice slow wave with a corresponding voltage distribution corresponding to the brain, uh, then you're good. So you either need uh, this specific combination of criteria one, four, and six, or you need at least five of, of any criteria combination. Basically, what I'm saying that if you have, if you miss one of these three, then you need all others. Now let's let's play a little bit with um, with uh, some EGs. So I will show you some EGs. Uh, I will start with uh, with a longitudinal bipolar montage like this one, and then here you can you can see 
the annotation indicates where I, I want you to look at the sharp transient. So is this epileptiform or non-epileptiform? So try, try to, to assess the criteria that you just learned. Well, this is the same in, in a common average montage. And then here, here comes the voltage map. Again, a very nice voltage map. So if, if you place your rocket propelled grenade, it, it would be in this direction. So very nice corresponds to a source in the brain. Now, this is spiky, so we have criterion one. Then the wavelength is different from the background activity. So you have two. Uh, then it's asymmetric. Look at it here, for example, you can see it very nicely. And then it's followed by, by a nice slow wave. You can see it clearly. It, it uh, grows out of the tail of the posit positive phase of the spike. So this is a nice slow wave. And then you've seen the, the voltage map, it corresponds very nicely to the brain. So here you, ha you have criteria four, uh, uh, here you have five criteria and you have the criteria one, four, six. So this is good. Now let's look at the next one. Again, this is in a longitudinal bipolar montage. Uh, this one, it's a phase reversal there. And then this is in a common average montage. And then let me show you the voltage map. Hmm. You can see it's, it's, it's irregular. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. So this does not correspond to a source in the brain. So you only have two criteria that is spiky and that the, the wave uh, duration is perhaps different than the background activity. So this does not fulfill our criteria. Now, next example here again, uh, a sharp thing, very nice, it's, it's, it's spiky, it's sharp. Uh, it, it has a phase reversal in bipolar montage. Uh, and then this is in common average montage. And then you can see uh, very nicely the end of it. Uh, you can see uh, the very nice voltage map, again, corresponding to a source in the brain. So let's see which criteria there are fulfilled. Well, it's spiky, one is there. Uh, the wavelength is absolutely different than what is before and after. Then hmm, I put it in, in parentheses because um, the, the asymmetry is not so clear. Maybe it's there. Four is clearly there. You, you can see the, the nice slow wave uh, growing out of the tail of, of the sharp wave. And then I've showed you the very nice voltage. Next one, again, very nice phase reversal here. It's spiky, phase reversal. Well, many clinical neurophysiologists would jump on it and, and say this is uh, epileptic form discharge. Now look at it in, in the common average montage. Yeah, you see, it kind of grows out from, from the background activity. You look at the voltage map, that's good. So this, this is a voltage map that corresponds to a source in the brain. Yet, it's only criterion one, one and six. Yeah, it's, it's spiky, or you've seen the, the phase reversal there. Uh, but the wavelength is the same. The wave duration is the same as before or after. It's symmetric. You don't have any asymmetry here. There is no um, a slow wave. You can see the background activity uh, uh, grows out of, of the, the transient. You don't have a, a, a clear cut slow wave there. Uh, yet you have you have the, the voltage map. But again, just two criteria. Now let's look at this. Again, we are uh, in a longitudinal bipolar montage first. Uh, and then uh, here we are uh, in a common average montage. And then here comes the very nice tangentially distributed voltage map, very nice source from the brain. Now, we have uh, four criteria, one, two, four, and six. So it's, it's spiky. Uh, the wave duration is clearly different than, than what's before and after. Uh, then you have a very nice slow wave growing out from the tail of, of it. Uh, and then you have a very nice uh, voltage map. So again, this fulfills our criteria. Again, this is a spiky phase reversal in a longitudinal bipolar montage. Many clinical neurophysiologists would say this is abnormal. Now, this is the same in a common average montage. This is the, the voltage map. And then this is um, uh, the interpretation. 
you can see it's spiky, so we have one. Two, well, I, I would be in doubt, uh, but, but I don't think it would be a big error of saying that, that the wavelengths, at least here, is, is different. And then you have the, the voltage map, but you don't have the other criteria. So again, this does not fulfill the uh, criteria set, also it fulfills some individual criteria. Now, uh, I said that I would come with some caveats. And that is not all that is sharp or spiky is abnormal because we have lots of artifacts, both biological and non-biological that, that can give spiky and sharp things. And then we have a, a long list of normal variants. Now, some of them would not fulfill our criteria like the 14 and six Hertz positive birds, the positive occipital sharp transients of sleep, the rhythmic temporal theta bursts of drowsiness, uh, the wicked spikes, the benign epileptiform transients of sleep or sh small sharp spikes would not fulfill our criteria. Yet, there are some normal variants which you really need to be aware of because they would actually fulfill the spike criteria. And these are the needle-like occipital spikes of the blind. You also need to put this into the uh, clinical context. And then there comes the slow fuse transient. I will show you some examples. And then the so-called six hertz spike and slow wave. Okay, let's have a look at, at some examples. So this is a small sharp spike or benign epileptiform transient of sleep. Uh, you can see that the positive and the negative phase have the uh, approximately the same amplitude or similar amplitude. This is, this is also very, very small, so it does not fulfill our criteria. And here you can, you can see the EKG artifact too. This is a very nice example of the 14 Hertz positive spike. This would not fulfill our criteria. And this is another example here. Um, this would not fulfill our criteria. Now, this, this is difficult because this would actually fulfill our criteria. You can see it here. This is a slow fuse transient. How is this generated? Well, you can see that uh, this is the background activity. And there is one wave of it that is more spiky. This would also give a phase reversal in a bipolar montage. So it's more spiky. And then it's followed by a slow wave. This slow wave uh, is a uh, um, uh, posterior slow wave of the youth. Now, this randomly occurs during the, the recording. And if you are so unlucky, that the posterior slow wave of use would come exactly after one of these more spiky waves of the background, then you have the slow fuse transient. So you have a sharp transient that is slowed, uh, uh, that is fused with a slow wave. Now, how do you realize that's the case? Well, it's very, very easy. You just look through the whole recording and then even if you see some spiky things followed by a, a slow wave, when, when you look through the recording, you would say, see that these two things dissociate. So, so many times you will see spiky waves of the background without slow wave, and then you will see also slow waves without posterior slow waves of the use without any preceding spiky thing. But this is sketchy, so, so really, really pay attention to this. That's another example here of the slow fused transient. This is a wicked rhythm. Uh, this would not fulfill uh, our criteria. Uh, this is, again, just a fluctuation of the background, uh, a non epileptiform sharp transient. This would not fulfill our criteria. This is a, a relatively sharply controlled rhythmic temporal theta of drowsiness. Again, um, our criteria would deselect this. Then here you can see the bridge rhythm. Again, this would not fulfill our criteria. Uh, this is interesting. This is a swallowing artifact. Now, if you will do a voltage map of this, it would not make sense uh, as a source from the brain. So it will not fulfill our criteria. Now, this is again a, a tricky one. You can see these sm relatively small amplitude spike and slow waves. So this, this is the so-called six hertz um, spike and slow waves. Now we have two versions, uh, the WAM, which is rather considered a, a pattern of uncertain significance or even a, a non-specific abnormality. Uh, WAM is for uh, wave, high amplitude, anterior, and male. Uh, the 
this is this one this would ful fulfill our criteria and then this is the other version of the six hertz spike and slow waves the so-called fold so it's a female uh, it's occipital uh, it's low amplitude and during the drowsiness of sleep now these are the posterior occipital sharp transients of sleep here This would not fulfill our criteria. Now let's talk about the specificity of, of the EG. So if, if you run the EG on healthy subjects, then you would have a very high specificity uh, if you uh, avoid this normal variant. But if you do that in neurology patients who do not have epilepsy, but have other neurological conditions, then the uh, amount of false positives will be higher. It's about 2.2% which gives you a specificity of 97.8 hmm, not bad you would you would say yes but i would like you to remember these subgroups and although this is from uh, an old paper i think you you need to to keep this in mind so in patients with several uh, with several conditions you have a high amount of false positives so these are patients who have clear-cut spike sharp ways but do not have epilepsy they never ever had a seizure and this is the groups of mental retardation, 30% false positives, perinatal brain injury, 24% false positives, cranial surgery, 12% false positives, and then brain tumor, 10% false positives. Some consolation is that in 14% of them, they will later on develop epilepsy, but 14% is not enough to, to use this for prediction. So rather be cautious when you see spikes sharp, sharp waves in patients who never ever had uh, a seizure. Psychiatry patient, again, um, uh, a patient group where you can, can encounter a higher amount of false positives, 2.7%. And relatives of patients with genetic epilepsy, well, again, 20% of them can have spike sharp waves, although they never ever had a seizure. So please keep in mind these caveats for these specific conditions. So um, this is a, a slide that I borrowed from my uh, friend and mentor, Bhagavan van M. de Boas. So spike and slow wave never equals epilepsy. You have to know the clinical context, the clinical background. Now, this is uh, just the last part of, of my presentation today. This is a little bit challenging, but who finds the spikes? Is it the algorithms and artificial intelligence or the human experts? Well, um, several papers uh, have been recently published with uh, convincing results that some of these uh, artificial intelligence based algorithm can actually work. So this is a, um, a paper from an American group where they, they look, uh, looked at the calibration error and they had this gold standard, the consensus uh, of experts on a spike or sharp wave or sharp transient. And this is um, another paper that we've uh, recently published um, in collaboration with our colleagues from Austrian Institute of Technology. Here, we validated it uh, against a solid gold standard uh, from the epilepsy monitoring unit. So for all these spikes, we know whether the patient has or does not have epilepsy. That was another paroxysmal episode. Now, there are challenges with, with all these uh, artificial intelligence uh, based approaches and algorithms. And the challenge is that the sensitivity of the algorithm, although it's, it's high, the specificity is low. So they, they would give you uh, many false positives. So a solution would be using so-called hybrid systems where the algorithms scan the whole EEG and they can do it very rapidly. So even for long-term monitoring several days, they, they scan it quite quickly and they give you high sensitivity. You would never be able to count 20,000 spikes during uh, long-term monitoring. And then the algorithm in the next step can group all these detected individual uh, spikes or sharp transients into clusters. So they can group even thousands of spikes into the same cluster if the algorithm thinks that they have the same location, same morphology, so they belong to the same type of spike. 
Now, this grouping of them saves time for the evaluation because you will not need to go through all the 10,000 examples of the same spike type. You just look at some of them and then you discard the whole, whole cluster or accept the whole cluster. So the hybrid system comes from the human intervention where you look at the spike clusters and then this gives the high specificity. So this combination of uh, the hybrid system where the algorithm gives you a high sensitivity and you, because you learn the criteria, uh, you give the system the high specificity seems to be uh, a reasonable approach. And I'm sure that in the near future, you will see more and more application of this. And actually first time this hybrid approach was published back in, in 2012. So here you can see uh, um, an algorithm that groups many spikes that the algorithm con considers of the same type in a cluster. And then uh, for um, a long-term monitoring, this results in 18 clusters. And then you look at, at some examples from, from uh, each cluster, and then you decide whether this is epileptiform or non-epileptiform. So normally it would take you a really long time to, to look through five days of, of continuous long-term video EG monitoring. With this method, it takes five minutes. Now the um, algorithm uh, achieved an accuracy of 91% compared to the humans. So to sum this up, identifying interictal epileptiform discharges is useful for diagnosing and characterizing epilepsy. Please be conservative. Overreading is more harmful than underreading. Please remember the IFCN operational criteria. So especially the spiky, slow wave, and then a voltage map from the brain. And then if you are missing one of these three, then you need to have all the others. Please be aware of the normal variant. In the end, interpret EEG in the clinical context. In the near future, I think we will see more applications of these hybrid systems, algorithms supervised by humans, and hopefully not the other way around uh, that uh, humans supervised by algorithms. So at the end of my talk, I would like to show you some aerial photos of the two affiliations where I work. So this is the Danish Epilepsy Center. So recently Donald Trump said that uh, Europeans uh, live in the forest. So at least this would be true for the Epilepsy Center, uh, yet our trees do not explode. And then this is the area of view of uh, the Aarhus University Hospital, uh, which is a kind of city within the city. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, we have some questions from the public, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Uh, does the cortical malformation modifies or makes harder to find the source? Well, what you often see with, with focal cortical dysplasia is um, a very small amplitude polyspike is, is like a brush. Uh, they can give also spikes and sharp waves like, like what I, I showed you. But in, in some cases, you, you really need to, to pay attention to this uh, uh, specific uh, morphology of the interictal epileptiform discharges of the focal cortical dysplasia. So like, like tiny, small brushes. These can be very focal. So if you have a uh, higher density electrode array, then, then uh, often uh, you can catch them better. OK. Um, then there's another one. How is the pole in a straight hertz generalized spike wave discharge, like in absence epilepsy or in a polyspike in myoclonia? And do you think this dipole helps in, for example, refractory generalized epilepsy? Um, now I, I'm not sure I got your question. So, so you are asking how is a, a polyspike and slow wave in a patient with absence epilepsy or? Yeah, in a generalized epilepsy, how it does the 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 dipole look like? Help. Okay, now yeah, I, I got look you. Like. Yes. 
So uh, what you will typically see in these cases is an anterior posterior gradient of the negativity towards the positivity. So um, the, uh, the uh, anterior part of the scalp will have the negativity and the posterior part has the positivity. Um, if you connect anterior pos uh, to posterior uh, direction uh, with a bipolar montage, then the anterior electrode will be always more negative compared to the posterior electrode in each of these channels. And this is what generated uh, this erroneous concept that the, these patients have generalized epilepsy on the whole uh, brain, which is not true. So actually, there are bilateral anterior frontal networks involved in generating these spikes. So you would have this bilateral synchronous uh, uh, voltage maps, but mainly anterior negativity and then posterior positivity. Okay, great, thank you. And good search imaging helps in case of bitemporal activities. Uh, once again, the, the beginning of uh, good good imaging or good search imaging helps in case of bilateral by temporal activities. Uh, well, what you will typically see in a patient with with uh, two independent foci. Uh, will, will be spikes that uh, would localize to the left temporal region and then other spikes would localize to the right temporal region, the same with different, uh, different seizures. What I, I hoped when I, I started doing source imaging uh, something like 12, 12 years ago was that um, after averaging and going for the onset of the spikes, I would be able to see whether this is genuinely from that side or propagated from the other side. Well, uh, I must disappoint you, this is not all, always uh, a probability. So the only method to distinguish uh, uh, the case where a patient has bilateral independent foci, left and right temporal lobe, or just one focus which rapidly propagates to the other side, creating the illusion of, of two independent foci, the only way to reliably assess the, that is putting stereo EEG electrodes. Okay, great. There's another one. What modifications can you see in a report after surgical resection? Uh, in a report after surgical re resection, sorry? Yeah, what modifications can you see in a report after surgical uh, resection? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, if, if you uh, reject the, the whole source, then, then often the, the uh, source will, will disappear. Um, Rarely you can see also patients who are seizure free yet still still left with, with some interictal activity back in, in, in the brain, mainly in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, but this, this is relatively rare, at least in, in my experience. Now, if you did not reject the, the whole source, then you usually still can see remaining epileptic form activity, usually at the edge of the resection. So this is also a scenario that we, we often see, especially when, when we don't move, uh, when we don't remove enough from, from uh, focal cortical dysplasia, for example, uh, we, can, we can see that the histopathology uh, is uh, confirming the focal cortical dysplasia, yet the patient is not seizure free. And then when we do a source imaging again, we very nicely usually see the epileptic form discharges localizing with the source imaging to the edge or, or a nearby region compared to the resection. Okay, there's another one that is Pretty similar. Well, what's the value of the post-operatory issue regard, uh, regarding seizures outcome? Yeah, basically this this is what what I said. So yeah. usually, if 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 patient is seizure free, spikes disappear, but not always. Okay, great. How is possible uh, possible for the slow waves can be epileptic epileptic form activity? Oh yes. So so. Um, Often, um, uh, if, especially in, in, with deep sources, you would only see the following slow wave. And then if, if you stick a depth electrode there, you would, you would realize that actually the, the slow wave is, is the following slow wave, yet you would not, not see the, uh, the spike. Yeah, this is a possibility. So when, when you see a slow wave, then it, it 
could be because of many different things. It could be just a slow wave because of, of uh, the cortical deafferentation, but it also can be the following slow wave of, uh, of a spike. So you, you don't know. So well, that's why, for example, in, in studies that uh, look at the predictive value of seizure recurrence after the first seizure. So the biggest predictive value have the clear-cut epileptiform discharges, but also uh, seeing slow waves uh, mean an increased risk, not as high as, as, as for the spikes, but, but it's, it's an increased risk. So yeah, some, some slow waves are actually the following slow waves of, uh, after a spike being there. And when we can consider them as an epileptic activity, epilepsy activity. When, when we might... When we can con consider them uh, as an epi activity. Ah, uh, the slow wave, these slow waves. Yeah. Slow waves. Uh, well, you don't... Uh, the, the correct answer is is that you, you you don't know just based on the EG, so so you need to put them in. Okay, well, I think there are, there are no more questions. Um, no. Okay. Thank you again. It was a, a wonderful talk. Thank you and thank you all for, for watching us. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.